I'm Marty Stauffer. With the first warm rains of the year, frogs and toads emerge from their winter sleep to herald the new season. Their rhythmic chorus is synonymous with springtime. Yet they're perhaps best known for their jumping ability. Their long, powerful legs allow them to jump many times their own body length. Frogs and toads are amphibians. It was this primitive group of vertebrates which first colonized the land. As a result, they've evolved remarkable adaptations for life both in and out of water. Join me as we explore the wet kingdom of the Prince of the Pond. Few places in North America are as charged with life as the undisturbed margins of our freshwater lakes and ponds. Though sometimes inhospitable places for humans, they provide important havens for an enormous diversity of plant and animal life. Over 300 million years ago, much of the earth was covered with water, but vast oceans and swampy areas were drying up. Out of necessity, some fish underwent an amazing transformation. Over the course of thousands of years, they began breathing with lungs. These air-breathing animals are called amphibians. The most familiar are frogs. The word amphibian is Greek. Translated, it means living both in water and on land. These early amphibians are believed to be the ancestors of all land vertebrates. The largest and most aquatic frog in North America is the bullfrog, found along ponds, lakes, reservoirs, and large rivers. Although it's native to the eastern United States, it's been introduced to much of North America. The bullfrog is the champion jumper in the frog family, able to leap 20 times its own length. Sometimes bullfrogs and their amphibian relatives are confused with another ancient order of life, the reptiles. But there are some obvious differences between the two. Some reptiles live in desert environments far from water, like the granite spiny lizard of the American Southwest. Frogs, on the other hand, are never far from water. A frog's eardrum is the flat, oval disc behind the eye. While the lizard's ears are internal, with a somewhat well-disguised opening on the surface. Frogs have clawless feet that are sometimes webbed. Lizards have claws and no webbing. With its huge eyes, a frog face is unforgettable. The lizard has small eyes set on the sides of its head. A frog's eyes are enormous by comparison. Amazingly, frogs absorb water and oxygen through their smooth, moist skin. The dry, overlapping scales of the lizard are only for protection. Lizards lay eggs on land and their young are mirror images of their parents. Another amphibian, the toad, 
is as dependent on water for egg laying as the frog. But the bumpy skinned toad can live farther from water. Toads and frogs were the first creatures in nature to have their own voices. Most species of frogs are clustered in the moister regions of our country. In the east, the bell-like songs of the tiny peepers are synonymous with spring, as welcome as the return of the migratory birds. In the southeast, a secretive bronze frog begins calling from the inaccessible shelter of a limestone sink. Some frogs have adopted more unusual survival strategies. The four-eyed frog turns its back when threatened, displaying two small swellings that look like a pair of huge and hopefully frightening eyes. From New England to the Arctic Circle, spring triggers the explosive breeding rituals of gregarious wood frogs. 3,000 miles away, the ancient music of the frogs heralds the beginning of spring in California. Pacific tree frogs, about the size of silver dollars, gather in low bushes to choose mates. The males croon away while the females watch passively or busy themselves with shedding and eating their skin. In some species, molting may be a daily occurrence. Male frogs are equipped with vocal cords and vocal sacs, which they inflate to attract a mate. Females tend to be voiceless. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Most tree frogs are nocturnal, like the bird-voiced tree frog of the southeast. At night, these diminutive singers descend from the treetops to fill the night sky with song. Our largest tree frog is an immigrant. The Cuban tree frog hitched a ride on a load of produce to Key West in the early 1900s and then migrated to the southern Florida peninsula. At just over two inches, the gray tree frog is the largest tree frog of the Northeast and one of the best camouflaged. Tree frogs like these green tree frogs don't have webbed hind feet. They have sticky toe pads for clinging to the slickest of surfaces. The explosive calls of the barking tree frogs sound like the yapping of small dogs they're our largest native tree frog, at about two and a half inches long. As a boy in Arkansas, I can remember falling asleep to a chorus of frog calls. Because different species lived around our home, their voices blended into a strange symphony of sound. The first frog I think I ever saw was America's most common, the leopard frog. In spring, the male advertises for a female, calling from a traditional mating pond. His voice sounds a little like a snore, but his croaks attract a female to the pond. Even though she's ready to reproduce, the female gives her suitor a merry chase. Leopard frogs live mainly on land. This may be their only return to the water all year long. 
The female leopard frog finally accepts the advances of the male, allowing him to wrap his front legs around her body, a behavior called amplexus that stimulates egg laying. Once the female releases her mass of eggs, the male quickly covers them with his sperm. Then both parents desert the offspring. eggs may be laid, most no bigger than the periods on a page, and vulnerable to a host of predators like water insects, fish, and snakes. Undisturbed, the eggs undergo rapid changes. Through the wonder of time-lapse cinematography, days have been shortened into seconds. of one to two weeks, tiny tadpoles begin to develop, wriggling, spinning, and finally fighting to break out of their jelly cocoon. Less than one week later, the survivors have begun nibbling on water plants and scraping green slime from rocks and sticks. All heads and tails, the young tadpoles look more like fish than frogs. In their pond environment, other creatures compete for food, like the freshwater snail. The lacy hydra casts its tentacles about searching for small crustaceans and worms to sting and devour. The developing tadpoles, or polywogs, as they're sometimes called, are unrelenting in their search for food, using small sucker-like mouths to feed and breathe. At three weeks, the leopard frog tadpoles are dwarfed by the nearly six inch long bullfrog tadpoles. Regardless of size, they're vulnerable to a host of predators, like the great blue heron. The pond is also a nursery for the offspring of the dragonfly. They too develop underwater, spending a year as nymphs. The ghoulish looking crayfish is far less a threat to the young tadpole than other creatures like fish and predatory water insects.
Giant water bugs are enormous in relation to most other water insects and very dangerous. Once caught, the chances of escape are slim. The water bug plunges its deadly beak into the flesh of the tadpole and begins to suck its lifeblood away. Tadpoles that do manage to survive go on to make a miraculous transformation. Hormones trigger secretions from the thyroid, causing radical changes in body structure. Subtle at first, in the end, the metamorphosis is startling. At about six weeks, the leopard frog tadpole stops eating. It begins to absorb its tail as food. Tiny hind legs begin to grow at the base of the shrinking tail. Lungs are beginning to develop. The rate of the metamorphosis varies, based largely on the temperature of the water. The front legs develop under the skin and then break through. The head begins to reform, and the tadpole begins to look less like a fish and more like a frog. The tail shrinks until it's only a memory, and the frog begins its ascent into the world of blue sky, cattails, and new discoveries. Transformed into the somewhat odd but endearing prince of the pond. With a lily pad for a throne, it has become a key link in the complex world around it, a principal predator of its environment. In contrast to their lives as vegetarian tadpoles, frogs are carnivorous predators. They hunt by sight, relying on sharp color vision and a nearly 360 degree view of their surroundings. Unlike most animals, the frog's tongue is fastened at the front rather than the back of its mouth. It's covered with a sticky substance that adheres to its prey. The long, lightning-fast tongue strikes out and snaps back with the hapless cricket securely glued down. The leopard frog is the most widely distributed amphibian in North America. In the Adirondacks of upstate New York, it lives alongside families of river otters. Young otters searching for food will make a meal of frogs, if they can catch them. Frog's evasive zigzags lead to the temporary safety of the river, but the alert parent takes up the chase where her inexperienced offspring left off.
If the leopard frog is the prince of the pond, then the bullfrog is the king. At eight inches in length, this amphibian giant can make a snack out of nearly anything it can fit down its throat. Bullfrogs hunt by lying in wait, then leaping forward as their prey passes. The powerful, sticky tongue will plunge out and wrap around the unsuspecting prey. The frog will usually submerge and swallow. Insects, mice, snakes, smaller frogs, even birds may fall victim to the voracious bullfrog. The patient frog moves slowly to another part of the shoreline. This time, its stealth pays off. The finch's movement triggers the attack. Once caught, the bird has virtually no chance of escape. All frogs and toads retract their eyes or blink when they swallow to help push food down their throats. A transparent inner eyelid closes from the bottom up, protecting the eye but letting the frog see underwater. In this case, the bullfrog's casual blink looks more like a self-satisfied wink to me. Tetons and nearby Yellowstone National Park are home to some of North America's most spectacular wildlife. But not all of this area's animals are spectacular or glamorous or even pretty by our standards. Yet every species is critical to the survival of the others. These homely salmon flies are an important food source for Yellowstone's fish and birds and little leopard frogs. Herpetologists that's what people who study frogs and toads are called. Herpetologists have proven that frogs are attracted to light and may even try to jump repeatedly through a piece of white cardboard. Light shimmering river water is just too good to resist. Look before you leap 
is not an adage, this adventuresome little water plopper follows. Somehow, the frog prince escapes, free to reign another day in this beautiful wet world. Because frogs and toads lead double lives, both on land and in water, they're extremely sensitive to pollution. Even in protected wetland habitats, amphibian populations are declining at an alarming rate all over the world. Experts contend that acid rain, pesticide pollution, and ultraviolet radiation may be causes of their rapid disappearance. Global conservation efforts may be needed to ensure the survival of the Prince of the Pond. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America. I'm Marty Stauffer. The great age of dinosaurs, when reptiles ruled the Earth, ended more than a million years ago. Now, only four major groups of them survive in North America. Snakes, turtles, lizards, and crocodilians. But from the way many people react to them, you'd think that each remaining reptile were out to rule the world all over again. Reptiles have always had a bad name. Are they just scaly monsters, ugly at best and dangerous at worst? Or are they highly specialized forms of life, often solitary and elusive, but for the most part harmless as leaves on a tree? Many of these cold-blooded creatures share our own backyards, and the basic pattern of their lives differs little from robins, squirrels, or other animals with which we feel more comfortable. Yet they've held us spellbound for centuries in a way that birds and mammals never have. Why are we so fearful of, and yet so fascinated by, these remarkable reptiles?
reptiles are cold-blooded creatures. Their body temperature depends completely on their surroundings. Many snakes can survive winter only by hibernating in caves where the temperature stays above freezing. And frequently, they do this in large numbers. As springtime warms the rocks around these limestone sinkholes in Manitoba, the red-sided garter snakes that winter here emerge by the thousands, more snakes than can be seen at one time anywhere else in the world. Warm weather also triggers a strong mating instinct. As many as 30 to 100 males may tangle in a writhing ball around a single female. Besides the warmth generated by so many bodies during the winter, these mass hibernations have a second survival advantage. Weakened by eight months without food, the snakes do not need to waste energy traveling in search of a mate. Though not many of us would care to join them. For the snakes, a snake pit is as natural as a day at the beach. Warmth is important to reptiles, both inside and outside their bodies. Though they depend mainly on sight, smell, and taste, some snakes, especially pit vipers like this Pacific rattlesnake, have a special organ for sensing the presence of warm-blooded animals. The rattlesnake must recently have had a meal, or else is still sluggish from the cool night, or the young mouse would never get away with being this foolish. Finally, the mouse seems to sense that it has awakened a sleeping giant. The rattlesnake's initial response may be slow, but once set in motion, its instincts are lightning swift. Fortunately for the mouse, it was just out of reach of those venomous fangs. But the rattles warn that the snake is now totally on the alert. The mouse will get no second chance. The scaly outer skin of reptiles is one factor that enabled them to become the first vertebrates to succeed on dry land. A snake is basically a legless lizard. This rattlesnake not only crawls on its belly like a reptile, but crawls with its belly, using its flat ventral scales to push the curves of its body along smoothly. Its rattles are modified scales. One rattle is added whenever the snake sheds its skin, which may be several times a year.
Man is not the only mammal that learns to be wary of snakes. The red fox kits have disturbed a bull snake sleeping outside their den. This relative of the gopher snake is harmless, but it puts on a terrific act, mimicking a rattlesnake as it hisses and vibrates the tip of its tail. It makes believers out of the fox pups, scaring one of them back into the den, which in turn scares its jumpy brother. After a while, the immediate fright subsides and fear becomes just another form of fun a game that will make these pups all the more ready for their next encounter with a snake. After all, the next one might have real rattles on its tail. I came across one of the more remarkable reptiles I've ever seen one day while I was out filming something else. Not only had this gopher snake just caught a mouse, but it was eating it with one of its two heads. Such genetic malformations are rare in nature. It's even more unlikely that a freak like this would live to maturity in the wild. An extra head is a handicap, not an advantage. One head does most of the work, while the second one seems to be just along for the ride. Most snakes do not eat very often, but when they do, they eat a lot. Their mouths are constructed to consume prey much bigger around than they are. Fur, bones, tail, and all. Like most snakes, the gopher snake is useful to man in keeping rodents and other pests under control. So it's too bad that the second head cannot hunt on its own. When is a snake not a snake? When it's a legless lizard, like this glass lizard. Snakes are thought to be descended from lizards, and perhaps this is the remnant of an intermediate stage. It prefers wet meadows and pine flatlands, also a favorite haunt of the bobcat. The glass lizard has a tongue like a snake, but snakes are virtually deaf, while most lizards hear quite well. In motion, there's little difference between a snake and a legless lizard, at least to the bobcat. This would seem to be an easy snack for the bobcat, but nature is always ready to surprise us when we least expect it. 
Just as the cat is about to take its first bite, its meal suddenly appears to be in two places at once. The tail end thrashes off down the stream bank, while the front half holds very still. Like any self-respecting cat, the bobcat goes for what's moving. As it stalks off with its prize, little does it realize that this contest has two winners. Unlike snakes, most lizards can shed their tails at will, allowing them to break off at a certain weak point and later regenerating an entire new one. Another lizard with typical and remarkable reptilian features is the anole, often called the Carolina anole. Whereas snakes usually shed their skins and leave them behind, lizards such as the anole often swallow theirs in pieces. For a short time, the shedding skin is like a straitjacket, but not so much that it interferes with the anole's incredible agility. This climbing lizard is more advanced than either snakes or glass lizards in its ability to move each eye separately. But its most amazing feature is its ability to change the color of its skin. The survival enhancing decorations of the male anole include a brightly colored throat pouch or dewlap. Usually it's folded up, but when distended, it serves both to ward off rivals and to attract the object of his reptilian affection. The anoles are members of the iguana family and are also related to chameleons. Many other lizards, both male and female, display prominent throat pouches. Its only native relative is the American crocodile. For me, both of these crocodilians are impressive living reminders of the primitive power of prehistoric reptiles. And one of the most primeval sounds on Earth is the mating bellow of a male alligator, the voice of a past so remote that man plays no part in its memory. Alligators mate in the water, 
the male herding the female in circles until she submits. Later, on land, she will pile decaying vegetation into a mound, which, as it decomposes, automatically incubates her several dozen eggs. Swampland inhabitants of our southern states, these great reptiles have made a comeback where protected, but still must struggle to hold their own against poachers and loss of habitat. We drain their swamps, we kill them for their hides, yet unless wounded or guarding a nest, they present little threat to man. It takes a number of years for any crocodilian to mature, and like most reptiles, they continue to grow throughout their relatively long lifespans. Let's hope that the offspring of these alligators will always have a place to bask in the sun. All reptiles must breathe air, and turtles are no exception. Even the soft-shell turtle, which spends much of its time buried in shallow riverbeds, does not breathe water. But neither does it need to leave its bed in the mud. Just so long as its incredibly long neck can stretch all the way up to the surface. Named for its thick leathery shell, the soft shell is one of several types of turtles completely adapted to aquatic life. Another is the snapping turtle, which lacks the long neck of the soft shell, but it more than compensates with its aggressive nature and patient stealth. To the unwary eye, it looks just like a floating log. Although their diets include quite a bit of plant matter, both soft shell and snapping turtles feed primarily on fish and other aquatic creatures. Unlike other reptiles, turtles lack teeth. They depend on the sharp edges of their beak-like jaws to capture their food. Fish seem perfectly shaped for their watery world, but the unusual structure of turtles reminds us of the great range of shapes and sizes of reptiles in general, and the intriguing variety of adaptations they have made to almost every environment. Reptiles of one sort or another are found from subtropical swamps to arctic tundra, from the sea to the mountains, and from lake bottoms to the driest desert. Though it is now endangered, the desert tortoise provides a good example of this contrast. Its rituals are those of a land animal. Here, two males meet and battle each other during the mating season. The object of this armored wrestling match is not only to defend a territory and win a female, but to render the opponent helpless. The weapon is a horny projection from their lower shells, called a gular shield. Each tries to wedge his underneath the other.
like prehistoric knights in armor, one finally succeeds. The desert hosts many dangers, and the most relentless is the sun itself. Unless the loser can right himself quickly, he is doomed. Meanwhile, winner takes all. Scavengers quickly reduce the defeated male to shell and bones. While not far away, life goes on. A female tortoise digs a hole in the sand in which to deposit her eggs. For reptiles, eggs enclosed by a protective shell were evolution's passport to a life on land. Amphibians must still rely on water to harbor their jelly-like eggs and vulnerable larval stages. But reptiles, with their scaly skins and ancient instincts, were the first creatures to evolve methods of internal fertilization and to develop eggs that were viable outside of water. Within each egg is an independent new life, preparing to take its place in the increasingly precarious balance of nature. The slow steps taken by this female tortoise to protect and provide for those undeveloped lives are, in a sense, echoes of the first steps taken by all reptiles toward the instinct for motherhood that we value so much in mammals. One of the things I've enjoyed most about studying the natural world is that the better you get to know it, the fewer things there are to be afraid of. Reptiles, like mixed human feelings, are with us to stay, mysterious reminders of the primeval wilderness from which we ourselves evolved. Hearing an Everglades alligator bellow at night or watching a desert tortoise lay her eggs gives me a strong sense of how ancient and powerful the forces of nature are and how delicately beautiful the ways in which she answers evolutionary challenges. These creatures deserve not only our fascination but our respect as remarkable reptiles. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.
I'm Marty Stauffer. To many people, caves are not the most appealing places to meet up with wild creatures. But ever since I was a kid in Arkansas, I've been fascinated with the mystery of these places. For primitive man, a cave was the most permanent and convenient form of shelter, although he may often have shared it with not so convenient wild guests. For many mammals, from bats to bears, a dark, dry cave is the ultimate in comfort and security, either as a temporary refuge or as a den in which to raise young. And for cold-blooded creatures, especially snakes, the constant underground temperature of a cave is essential for winter survival. It's common for snakes to gather by the dozens, hundreds, or even thousands in communal hibernation dens. What is not common is for a human to observe certain behavior that occurs under these conditions, which is why I came to this cave in Oklahoma to see Western Diamondback rattlesnakes. Join me as we witness one of the most hypnotic, rarely seen events of the reptile world, the combat ritual of a snake dance. This cave, outside Mangum, Oklahoma, is well known for its large population of rattlesnakes. Each October, the snakes return to this same denning site to hibernate. By April, their fat reserves are depleted, and the urge to find food forces them to leave the refuge of the cave. This is the best time to observe their courtship and mating behavior. But at first, I'm the one being observed. Using a remarkable heat sensing organ, they're aware of my presence long before I'm aware of theirs. This facial pit, located behind the nostril, detects objects with a higher temperature than their surroundings. This adaptation helps them to locate and to strike at warm-blooded prey, and is why they're called pit vipers. Although it's risky, my curiosity overcomes my fear, and I continue further into the cave. I hope to see for myself the bizarre behavior displayed during the combat ritual that I've heard so much about. Western diamondbacks attain the largest den concentrations of all rattlesnakes sometimes a thousand to a cave. This increases my chances of seeing a snake dance. Unfortunately, it also increases my chance of getting bitten. The shadowed walls seem to be crawling with snakes, but luckily the cave is fractured with holes which allow sunlight to filter through.
came prepared with a walking stick. It's the only way for me to clear a path through this slithering maze. Snakes are irritable, to be expected after a long winter fast. I've also angered them by moving them out of the way. So if I want to see the natural behavior of undisturbed snakes, I'll have to search deeper into the cave. Because of its short temper, aggressiveness, and large size, the western diamondback is considered the most dangerous reptile in the U.S. The eastern diamondback is the largest, averaging six feet, and the Mojave rattlesnake has, by far, the most deadly venom of all pit vipers. But the western diamondback inflicts more serious bites than all other kinds of rattlesnakes combined. Although they can inject enough venom at one time to kill 45 humans, surprisingly few people die from a bite. Out of the thousands of people that are bitten each year, only about a dozen do not recover. Directly ahead of me, I see a male and female engaged in courtship behavior. The jerking motion of the male's head as he slithers over the female's body is a prelude to mating. His questioning tongue picks up scents from the female to determine her receptivity. Suddenly, a second male approaches from the rock above. The vibrating rattles and flicking tongue are part of a threatening pose intended to frighten away enemies. Finally, a chance to witness one of the strangest rituals found in nature. The courting male rises up to meet the challenger, and the two rivals begin swaying rhythmically. This combat dance is an amazing example of the truth being even stranger than the tall stories about rattlesnakes. It was first believed that the snakes, twisting about and seemingly linked together, were mating. Now it's known that only males perform this symbolic dance. 
It has also been observed between males of different species and at different times of year, sometimes without a female nearby. What exactly stimulates the males to dance is not clear, but the goal seems obvious, to establish sexual dominance. With almost half of their bodies poised upright, the opponents rock back and forth until one senses an advantage and throws the other off balance. As their excitement builds, the momentum of the dance quickens. Lacking arms and legs, the snakes wrestle by literally throwing their weight around. Rattlesnakes communicate their annoyance by rattling. However, the term rattle is actually a misnomer, as there is no object rattling around inside like in a child's toy. The sound is produced by the loosely interlocking lobes rubbing together when vibrated. As captivated as I am by this odd performance, I almost forget to watch out for the other snakes. This one's much too close for comfort. It lets me know loud and clear that I'm the intruder. I'm saved by the rattle this time, but diamondbacks don't always give a warning before they strike. rival males, about 10 feet away, don't seem to notice my presence as they continue their sparring. The wrestling match seems to be a test of coordination as well as of strength. This exhausting dance can go on for several hours, but snakes are very strong for their size. Pound for pound, they have more muscle tissue than any other animal. We humans could learn a valuable lesson from these ancient reptiles, whose contests are settled without any intent to kill their opponent. In any case, their death-dealing fangs are useless against each other since rattlesnakes are immune to their own venom. This explains how they can bite and then swallow their poisoned prey. An intense fear of snakes leads some people to believe that rattlesnakes are cold-blooded killers who use their poison to the detriment of mankind. But venom and the means of injecting it evolved as a way of securing food. When striking a human in self-defense, rattlesnakes regulate the amount of poison they inject. Their first inclination is to conserve venom and they rarely inject a fatal dose. They often bite people without injecting any venom at all. Non-venomous constrictors risk being injured by a struggling bird or small mammal. But the powerful venom of a rattlesnake makes it unnecessary for the snake to hold on to and subdue its prey. To me, the most striking thing about rattlesnakes is not the potency of their venom, but the incredibly efficient method of injecting it. The hollow fangs function like hypodermic needles, and the deadly fluid is independently injected from one or both fangs. The fangs are hinged and fold back when the mouth is closed. They're shed every few months and replaced with new ones. I should probably leave soon, but I'm curious how much longer they can keep fighting.
Rattlesnakes are indigenous only to the Americas. So when Europeans settled this land, their reaction to these unfamiliar and highly dangerous vipers was to wipe them out. Among American Indians, however, there was a surprising taboo against killing rattlesnakes. They were thought to be messengers from the spirit world and were treated with a combination of fear and reverence. The Cherokees believed that if you killed a rattler, another would appear. And if you killed that one, more would appear until you were finally driven crazy. Perhaps these myths originated from common nightmares. Snakes are the most common animal in our dreams. Research shows that our irrational fears about snakes are most active when we're asleep. These sinister looking creatures do seem to stir the imagination. Yet the rattlesnake of song and story far surpasses its real life counterpart in degree of danger, size, and temperament. Tall tales echoed from around the campfire are filled with reports of rattlesnakes that can outrun a man or leap into the air to bite a person on horseback. The truth is, almost any snake, poisonous or not, will avoid encounters with man whenever possible. Because of this, we don't meet up with snakes often enough to grow accustomed to their strangeness. Our impressions and fears are not formed by watching snakes go about their curious and fascinating way of life. Rather, they're formed by the countless ways our society portrays rattlesnakes as evil and fearsome demons. I continue to keep an eye on the snakes around me, or it could be the first and last time I observe this hypnotic dance. This snake dance, performed by many species of old world snakes as well, has been a source of fascination for mankind since the time of Aristotle. It's believed that the symbol of the medical profession, or caduceus, was partly influenced by this hypnotic rite.
with the final blow, the battle is won. Since snakes are deaf to airborne vibrations, they can't hear each other's threatening rattle. But to me, their sounds are especially ominous inside this cave. Rattlesnakes evolved during the Pleistocene era, or the age of giant mammals, when horses, camels, and bison roamed the earth. The rattle evolved as an alarm bell, which would drive away creatures that might have trampled the snake. With sexual dominance established, the victor returns to the female to resume courtship. I've observed wildlife in many parts of the world, from tropical coral reefs to the Arctic tundra. But watching this ancient ritual of the snake world has been one of my most intriguing encounters. The loser lies motionless, uninjured, yet exhausted by the prolonged struggle. Rattlesnakes are ovoviviparous. That's right, that's really a word. Ovoviviparous. That means the flexible eggs are retained and actually hatch inside the mother's body. She gives birth to an average of eight to 10 live young. The first observations of this live birth led to the belief that they swallow their young for protection and that the young emerge from the parent's body only after the danger has passed. At the time, it was assumed that rattlesnakes also hatched from eggs, just like all other species. As the defeated male retreats from the battleground, I leave the cave for the safety of the daylight world. Now if I can just avoid stepping on any snakes on my way out. Many of the rattlesnakes from this cave are captured and killed each year for a rattlesnake roundup in Mangum, Oklahoma. Although such hunting is a part of our American tradition, these unique reptiles have an important place in nature. Hopefully, with common sense and proper management, future generations will also be able to witness the intriguing Dance of the Diamondbacks. Caves were once thought to be doorways to hell, dark places where evil spirits and imaginary creatures lurked in wait. Today we know better. Man has gradually realized that caves can be a source of fascination rather than fear. They remind us that nature has evolved a type of creature to fill every niche on earth and even under the earth. Unlike man, Animals are comfortable in the dark. 
And creatures that make their homes in caves are usually less harmful than the more familiar ones of our daylight world. With curiosity and patience, we can shed light on the most mysterious secrets of their lives. With careful observation, we can see something as beautiful and intriguing as a snake dance. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America. I'm Marty Stauffer. Turtles have plodded around on land and glided through the rivers and oceans of the world for more years than any other vertebrates. Their simple, functional design has remained basically unchanged for over 200 million years. It stands to reason, then, that we should know more about turtles than almost any other animal. But do we? Misconception and old wives' tales surround these unusual holdovers from an age which precedes the dinosaur. Join me and we'll find out the truth about turtles. How many of us grew up believing that turtles could slip out of their shells? But a turtle can no more shed its bony fortress than we can strip ourselves of our skeleton. How about the common belief that once on its back, a turtle cannot right itself? For the most part, they can. Everybody knows turtles are homely, right? Well, anyone who's seen a Kegel's map turtle or a spotted turtle would surely disagree. Another colorful example, the painted turtle. As for all turtles being slow, consider this spiny softshell turtle. It can swim faster than most fish. And sea turtles glide effortlessly through the oceans of the world, forever shattering our illusions that all turtles are clumsy. The loggerhead sea turtle, like all turtles, is descended from giants that roamed the deep primordial seas millions of years ago. The largest, Archelon, was 12 feet long. Although modern sea turtles are smaller, their structure has remained basically unchanged. Their flipper-like limbs remind me of wings, a turtle as big as a bathtub that can fly through the water at up to 25 miles an hour. Turtles eat an almost limitless variety of plants and animals. This four inch long loggerhead musk turtle is stalking live prey on the bottom of a slow-moving creek in South Georgia.
crayfish will grow another claw to replace the one taken by the musk turtle. The stink pot musk turtle, named for the smelly odor it emits under stress, sometimes feeds on pond snails. Even a small frog, like this spring peeper, can become a meal for a turtle. The moist forests of the east provide ideal habitat for the eastern box turtle. On a cool summer day after a rainstorm, the red-eyed male begins to forage, checking out likely places to find food within his home range of only a few hundred yards. As a young turtle, he was probably more carnivorous. As an adult, his tastes expanded to include leafy plants, flowers, fungi, and fruit. With color vision similar to ours, he can see if fruits, like these wild strawberries, are ripe. Experts believe that turtles can see colors in the red range particularly well. Typically, box turtles watch the movements of their animal prey, then move within grabbing distance. Most turtles are opportunistic, taking advantage of food as it becomes available, even feeding on fungi poisonous to humans. The Amanita muscaria is poisonous to humans, but it apparently has no ill effects on the long-lived turtle species. In fact, reaching the century mark is not unheard of and at least one box turtle is reported to have lived 138 years. While box turtles are reputed to be passive in nature, this three-toed box turtle is cause for alarm. Eastern male, though smaller, attempts to drive the three-toed male away. the smaller turtle retreats inside his nearly impregnable armor. In the sandy soil of south central Florida, a tunnel 35 feet long leads to the burrow of a gopher tortoise. Unknowingly, its excavation skills provide havens for other animals, like the endangered Florida mouse. The gopher tortoise is itself endangered. Its dwindling numbers concern scientists, 
who see it as a keystone species, one upon which other animals depend. Another severely endangered reptile that clings to existence in the deep south is the alligator snapping turtle. It has the grisly reputation of severing human digits with one powerful snap of its raptor-like beak and razor-sharp jaws. Harvested to the brink of extinction by turtle trappers like Al Redmond, these giants were canned by the soup companies and sold to supermarkets and restaurants in the United States and Europe. Al Redmond has stopped killing snappers and committed himself to their survival. Still, his turtle trapper tales are compelling. As we was butchering these larger turtles that come off of the Flint River, we noticed cracked shells, indentations in the shells, and as we were slaughtering these turtles, we started finding Indian artifacts, arrowheads, spear points, where they had been shot and it was embedded, usually in the tenderloin in their back would be a large growth. Sometimes you could see part of the point sticking out, sometimes it was totally covered up. And something else too, we was finding musket balls, this right here, and also the 50 caliber sharp bullet was used during the Civil War, which was in the early 60s, 1860s. We found several of these where they had shot these larger turtles. We know these turtles are old, but we didn't realize they was that old. Now Al traps adults like this large male for breeding purposes only. Each year, he releases thousands of baby snappers back into their former range. This turtle that uh, we caught in a trap right here. You're looking at a turtle right there. Oh, I hadn't weighed him. I'm guessing 145, 150 pounds, so you're talking about a 200-year-old animal. These turtles does not average a pound a year in the wild, it's no way. So if you look back at the big one we caught, you know, the 316 pound turtle, you could very easily be talking about a turtle 500 years of age. And I seriously believe that. Oh, it's gonna take a lot of work to save these turtles. You know, this is one of the largest freshwater turtles in the world, so he's worth saving. Eastern Pennsylvania is Amish country fertile rolling hills where farming is carried on away from the roar of the industrialized world. In spring, the surrounding woods are full of flowers and small clear streams. A female wood turtle takes to the water and heads downstream. Nicknamed sculptured turtle, for the texture of its rough top shell, and also nicknamed red legs for the burnt orange color of its skin. The rare wood turtle leads a solitary life, except in the spring mating season. A large male waits in the still water near an old beaver dam. Wood turtles live primarily on land, but normally breed in the water. The male's plastron, or lower shell, is concave and fits over the female's domed top shell, or carapace. He grabs her with his long, strong claws and wraps his tail under the rim of the carapace. Sometimes the male becomes so focused on his courtship ritual, he forgets to let the female come up for air. Less than a month later, 
the female has selected and excavated her nest site, a sunny spot on a sandbar near the curve of a stream. Over the course of several hours, she lays 10 eggs and covers them with a layer of sand. Sixty days later, the nest site is intact, unmolested by predators. Some experts believe that a majority of turtle nests are destroyed before hatching, but this one has remained safely hidden. Underground, the hatchlings are struggling to break out of their leathery enclosures. Using a sharp egg tooth on the tip of their beak, they slice a hole in the shell and begin to struggle free. First, yolk sacs on their soft plastrons provide nourishment for the youngsters. Here we see a day-by-day -day time lapse. After four days, the sac is absorbed until it disappears altogether. Perhaps one in every 100 wood turtle hatchlings will survive the 15 years it takes to reach adulthood. Their numbers have decreased dramatically for the all too familiar reasons, habitat fragmentation and destruction, and automobile traffic. But the most serious threat to wood turtle survival as a species comes from the harvesting of animals for the pet trade. For now, these tiny reptiles rush to cover in hopes of enjoying a long life of freedom in the Pennsylvania countryside. Natural predators, like raccoons, also threaten turtle survival digging up turtle nests and eating the eggs. They even prey on adult turtles if the opportunity arises. Late in the afternoon, the raccoon begins to forage for crustaceans in shallow, muddy water, a favorite habitat of the small eastern mud turtle. As children, my brothers and I found turtles in the woods around our home with chewed up shells and missing toes and feet. Luckily for the mud turtle, it can close up as tightly as a box turtle. The raccoon is dexterous and persistent, but recognizes the futility of breaking into the mud turtle's shell. The semi-aquatic mud turtle does a disappearing act. Many freshwater turtles can stay submerged or buried in the mud for weeks at a time during winter. Long after dark, the turtle stayed safely hidden under the mud of the Alabama swamp. To the northeast in South Carolina, lies a nuclear facility containing aquatic habitats, a few of which are contaminated by waste disposal.
this immense natural laboratory, research scientists like Whit Gibbons are studying the effects of radioactive contamination on wildlife. Uh, turtles live in these aquatic habitats, just like they live everywhere around this region. And many of them, when they leave the site or we capture them, are radioactive. We can check this one to see if it is a radioactive turtle. And sure enough, it is radioactive. As you can see, there's nothing unusual about the appearance of this turtle. It isn't a radioactive ninja mutant turtle or anything like that. There may be some genetic effects, and we have studies in progress at this time to examine for genetic effects as a result of low-level radiation or chemical contamination of various sorts. Witt and his colleagues have devised ways to study turtles without hurting them like photocopying the plastrons of these yellow-bellied pond sliders. It's the equivalent of fingerprinting a human. Later, if the same slider is recaptured, photocopy records will reveal its identity, and data can be improved about growth rates, lifespans, and turtle movements from one habitat to another. A similar non-destructive technique is the X-raying of females to see how many eggs they lay. For the most part, turtles have not been treated kindly by people. Perhaps the ultimate in exploitation occurred in the Chesapeake Bay area and centered around the diamondback terrapin. Terrapins are turtles of brackish and saltwater marshes of our east and gulf coasts. Once the diamondbacks were a staple food source for Native Americans. Slaves on southern plantations sometimes refused to work, complaining that a steady diet of terrapin was unbearable. Still, the terrapin appeared to flourish. Then, in the late 1800s, gourmets decided that terrapin was the ultimate dining delicacy. These bottom feeders were easy to catch. They were successfully promoted as more profitable to raise than chickens. In 1891 alone, nearly 90,000 pounds of terrapin meat sold in Maryland fish markets at 25 cents a pound. In fancy restaurants here and abroad, no champagne dinner was complete without the delicate, dainty taste of terrapin. But by the 1920s, hunters found less than a thousand pounds of terrapin to harvest. The price ballooned to over a dollar twenty per pound. In the 1930s, the species appeared to have been eaten to extinction. Today, the terrapin is trying to make a comeback. However, diminished habitat and other human threats persist. They die needlessly each year in unattended private crab pots. Once trapped, they can survive about five hours before they drown. Thousands of terrapins could be saved if individual crabbers would check their pots every few hours, pull their traps out at night, or leave an airspace in shallow water. Some simple steps to conserve what may be the most celebrated turtle in America. The terrapin is the mascot of the University of Maryland. Just rubbing the nose of Testudo is supposed to bring good luck. Of course, I don't believe in superstition, but just in case.
This monarch of turtledom regularly struts his stuff at U of M athletic events. The diamondback terrapin, celebrated as it is, is something of an enigma to scientists. On Kiowa Island, South Carolina, Earthwatch volunteers are braving mosquitoes, mud, and high humidity to track down diamondbacks. Terrapins are relatively small turtles. Although females may reach nine inches, males are only half as large. They regularly capture mollusks and crustaceans, like these abundant fiddler crabs. Diamondbacks were named for the bold, patchwork quilt pattern on their shells. Under the supervision of Whit Gibbons, the Earthwatch team determines the sex of each captured terrapin, measures the length of the carapace, records the location netted, and then marks the shell so that it can be identified if recaptured. So far, the group has captured and recaptured hundreds of individuals. Their data will help in the development of a wild terrapin management program. Once this resilient little reptile was relentlessly hunted for its meat, only now is it being appreciated as a wild creature worthy of our protection and respect. These long-lived creatures have survived ice ages, predators, and all manner of natural disasters, but they're now threatened worldwide. Exploding human populations damage critical turtle habitat. Pollution threatens their rivers, and vehicles regularly mow them down as they try to move to more suitable surroundings. Our education holds the key to their preservation. If we so choose, we still have time to learn the truth about turtles. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America. I'm Marty Stauffer. You're about to meet the fiercest and most efficient family of predators in the world, the weasels. They're so ingrained in our awareness, the names of some are fixed in our language. To weasel out of a deal, to ferret out a solution, to badger into submission, and to skunk an opponent. Though we may think of weasels themselves as bloodthirsty, the weasel family also includes the otters the most fun-loving of all animals. This group of streamlined carnivores includes the marten, mink, fisher, wolverine, and even the sea otter. All are highly prized for their fur, and some can move faster than the eye can see. We'll start our study with the weasel itself as we explore the weasel, sleek and savage.
High mountains are one of the weasel family's many homes. Though small, a weasel will attack prey much larger than itself, like this snowshoe hare. The weasel was not successful this time. It's winded from the chase and even hungrier than it was before. So it keeps a sharp eye out for easier prey. An unwary deer mouse has little chance with a weasel lying in wait. One bite to the neck brings instant death. The weasel must have frequent nourishment. It stores its catch in a burrow to be eaten a little at a time over the next several hours. Members of the weasel family are known as mustelids. Mustelid means mouse catcher. This family includes the sea otter, the river otter, and the ferocious wolverine. It also includes the forest dwelling fisher and marten, and the prairie dwellers, the black footed ferret and badger. Most common of all are the weasels themselves, short-tailed, long-tailed, and least. One of these three weasels is found in every part of the country. In the northeastern states, plentiful autumn gives way to harsh winter, and scarcity leads to competition, even among members of the same species. This weasel was brown in summer, but is now in a pure white coat, sometimes called ermine. These family battles, though bloody, depend on cleverness as much as might and seldom are fatal. Seeing the futility of frontline defense, the irritated burrow owner tries a second strategy. It leaves through another exit, circles, and delivers the uninvited guest a well-placed nip on the rear.
The intruder watches from a safe distance as the defending ermine verifies the plan's success. In spite of its protective camouflage and the cover of snow tunnels, the ermine's scent remains. And another hungry carnivore, the coyote, is also out hunting. Standing for a better look, the ermine surveys its territory and judges the coast to be clear. This little weasel weighs only five ounces, 100 times less than its attacker. But those five ounces stretch into 15 inches of incredibly flexible muscle. That strength and flexibility, combined with its ferocity, give the ermine a fighting chance. Seizing a split-second opportunity for escape, the ermine leaves the coyote a little wiser. As winter wears on, wildlife welcomes the gradual softening of snow and ice. The ermine still spends most of its time hunting. 50 to 80 percent of its prey are small rodents, but it's always alert for an occasional variation in menu. On the ground, a chickadee has little protection against its speedy attack. This female ermine is hunting small prey from snow tunnels. 
male ermine usually hunt for larger animals and above the snow. As the snow disappears, new life sprouts beneath last fall's dried foliage. And a mink moves like a shadow. The white coat that protected the ermine in winter has not yet changed, and now sets it off as an easy target for its dark-furred cousin. Six times heavier and 10 inches longer than the ermine, the mink is equally well equipped with speed, cleverness, and a voracious appetite. The weasel's quickness and ability to hide have confused the mink. Even without camouflage, the ermine has escaped again. April or May, a female weasel finds a den. She lines her nest with soft mouse fur and grasses and gives birth to six or seven young. The eyes and ears of young weasels are sealed. They are almost naked and during their first weeks are totally dependent on their mother for milk and protection. It's now summer. The six-week-old weasels have been moved to the safety of a new, clean den.
in spite of the move, their mother has failed to lose the larger, usually solitary male weasel, which has followed her scent. Most members of the weasel family mate again right after one litter of young is born. In all female weasels, fetal development is delayed 11 months until a month before the young are born, the following April or May. But like all good mothers, she hastily returns to her responsibilities. As the summer moves on, the young weasels spend more and more time playing outside the den. Some of the males are already twice the size of their female siblings. And the females, which were born fertile, may already have been impregnated by a visiting adult male. By late summer, the new generation of weasels is fully grown. Each has established and respects territorial boundaries apart from its mothers. But there is no such respect from predators, including this fox-faced marten. Although the marten usually preys on small rodents, it would not hesitate to kill a member of its own clan. The weasel makes a valiant attempt to frighten away a challenger ten times its size but the marten definitely has the upper hand.
Once again, the quick-witted weasel has escaped. But this one's looking a little worse for wear. By now, you should be getting the idea that the life of a weasel is no less hectic than that of its prey. Another winter has arrived, and the weasel's hunger makes it bold enough to attack a cottontail rabbit six times larger than itself. This rabbit has already been pursued by this weasel for over an hour. The weasel has relentlessly chased the rabbit from one clump of cover to the next. Usually able to fell small prey with a swift bite to the neck, the weasel must employ a different tactic with larger quarry. And now the rabbit, probably going into shock, becomes almost complacent to the weasel's approach. It circles and waits for an opening biting wherever possible. The weasel repeatedly grabs the rabbit, weakening it. We humans are sometimes shocked by what we see in nature. As a result, we categorize creatures as innocent victims or guilty killers. Even death itself can be quick and good or slow and bad, but nature makes no such judgments. A final bite to the neck and the rabbit's struggle is over. Like all predatory animals, the weasel must kill to live. By following this natural instinct, it fulfills a vital role in maintaining the balance of nature. Next week, we'll continue to explore the weasel family. A bear-like weasel that smells like a skunk, the wolverine. Weasels which hunt in water, our lovable otters. A down-to-earth weasel, the badger, and the weasel called a fisher, which doesn't fish. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.